Welcome back to my tutorial series on making an action RPG. Today we're going to go over interactions with NPCs. The first thing we want to do is to create an NPC. I'm going to create a new scene, call it NPC, and I'm going to make it a static body. First things first, the NPC needs a sprite. We're going to create a new atlas texture and call it villager one idle. Now we go to grid snap, we zoom in and set the step size to 16 by 16 and select the idle sprites that we want. Going back to the NPC scene, I'm going to add a sprite. I'm going to use the new idle atlas, and it has four horizontal frames. I'll add an animation player, create an animation called idle, and animate the frame property. Every 0.25 seconds, we will change the frame and put it on a loop. We want to start at zero, then one, and there's our idle animation. The NPC also needs a collider, We'll add a collision shape 2D. We'll make it a circle and we'll move it down to exclude part of the NPC's head so that the hero can move behind him. On the NPC's collision layer, NPC is not terrain, it is not a pit, it is an obstacle, and it is interactable. Call the root node NPC. If we remember what we did with the pot, we had to define an interacted method since it's on the interactable layer. So let's add a script to the NPC and define an interactive method. However, in this case, we don't want the hero to pick up the NPC. Rather, we want the NPC to say something. As a placeholder, let's just print a message. It's dangerous to go alone. So let's instantiate the NPC into this room and we'll move him over here. And before we hit play, there's just one thing I realized we should probably do. If we go to the hero, we can see that its collision box is like this. And that's going to be a problem because if we're trying to interact with something that's above us, the collision box is longer than the interactable detector is. Also, we should probably not have the collider go all the way up to the top of the hero's head so that it's possible to have things slightly behind the hero. So I'm going to modify the collision shape to reduce its size. I'm going to turn it into a circle. I'm going to shrink it a bit, and I'm going to move it down to here. Now this is still a little awkward because the interactable detector isn't centered on it. So why don't we move the interactable detector up to coincide with the center of the circle? And then I'll make it a little longer, let's say 12. And in the hero's code where we have the interactable detector rotate, we will modify that to be facing times 12 instead of eight. So now I'm going to go up to the NPC and interact. And you can see here in the output, the NPC says it's dangerous to go alone. We do notice something undesirable, which is that the hero is appearing underneath the NPC. Um, this is because of their order. You can see the NPC is below the hero and therefore appears in front of the hero. Uh, if we swap their order, then the hero would always appear in front of the NPC, but that's also a problem if the hero moves behind the NPC. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to add a Y sort. Y sort is a node that sorts all of its child nodes based on their Y position. So that'll make sure that if one node is above another one, it will appear behind that node. So now let's move the hero, the pot, and the NPC to the Y sort. And now we can see that the hero is properly in front of these objects or behind the objects, depending on where they are in the scene. Also, I just realized that our NPC animation isn't playing, so we can just fix that by calling it in the ready function, play idle. Another issue that I'm noticing right now is that it's a little bit difficult to go up to the NPC because since the collision boxes are curved, we sort of just slide around them. So I'm actually going to change the collision boxes back into rectangles. So this becomes a rectangle 2D, which we shrink down to the appropriate size. And we'll do the same with the hero. There we go. Now that we can interact with the NPC, we want a means to display their words to the player. And rather than code something from scratch, we're going to take advantage of one of the many freely available add-ons available through Godot's asset library. So we'll go up here and click on asset lib, and we're going to search for dialogue. As you can see, this is a problem that many people have solved before. I'm going to use this dialogue manager by Nathan Hode. You can see there are a bunch of tutorial videos here that show how to use it. I've actually already watched these, but the way that we install this is first we click download. We want everything under the add-ons folder, which is everything in this case. So click install. The next thing we need to do is enable this. So we go into project settings, we go to plugins. You can see dialogue managers right here and we click enable. And that's it. That's the setup for the dialogue manager. 
You can see that now that this is enabled, we have this dialog tab up here. If we open this up, we see that we can create a new dialog file. So let's do that. For now, we'll just put it in the root directory and we'll call it dialog. Nathan has very kindly provided us with some examples of how to use this wonderful add-on. As we can see, we have an identifier for a bit of dialog, which is the node title. Let's call this villager one dialog. We can give the villager a name. Uh, let's call him Bob. Bob is going to say, it's dangerous to go alone. Take this. And I'm not going to go into all of the cool stuff that you can do with this, but Nathan's videos describe it in detail and the GitHub page also has some helpful information if you're interested. The next thing we need to do is to create a balloon to display the dialogue. You can see that in the add-on, there's an example balloon folder here. We're just going to duplicate that and call it balloon and we're going to move it out of the add-ons and into our project. There are some edits that I would like to make to the balloon. First of all, we'll rename it. This is what the balloon looks like, but I don't think that this fits the aesthetic of our game very well, so I would like to change it. First things first, this balloon has a nine patch rectangle. It's a rectangle that's divided into nine parts. The parts on the side can be stretched out to accommodate any size. I'm going to replace it with this text box graphic that I created. Then we need to go into the nine patch rectangle and adjust these a little bit. The way this works is the space between these dots on the outside and the dashed lines on the inside defines the nine regions. And now we can see that the balloon has been replaced by this large black text box. I would also like to change the font to a more pixelated font. Right now, the font files are these Open Sans files, but I would like Cayetano. And I've just imported four TTF files. There's the regular file, and then there's italics, bold italics, and bold. This balloon already has font resources created, so I'm just going to replace these with the appropriate Cayetano font file. Bold, italic, and regular. And we can't see the font right now because it's black on black, so let's go to this dialog node. We'll go to theme overrides here, and we're going to change the color from black to the default, which is white. We also want to change the color for the character, which indicates who's talking. So font, theme overrides, color, just uncheck it and use the default. Uh, and likewise, response template, we're also going to change the color to white. Now, if we go back into add-ons and go to dialogmanager.gd, we can see we have this method show example dialog balloon. We're going to copy this, go to the NPC, and paste it here, and then we're going to modify it to suit our purposes. So first of all, because get next dialog line comes from dialog manager, we'll need to preface it with that. We're going to call it show dialog balloon and edit the recursive call accordingly. Rather than using the example balloon, we're going to use our balloon, which is right here. So I'm going to copy the path and paste that here. It looks like dialog resource is another thing that is defined in the dialog manager. So let's preface it with that. And now when we interact with the NPC, we can call show dialog balloon. The first argument is title and title refers to the identifier for the lines of text. So in this case, villager one dialog. Local resource is referring to the dialog resource. Uh, in this case, dialog.tres. I'll just copy that path and put it here as a preload. And we won't worry about extra game states here. Oh, one more thing we need to do is uh, right here in dialog, these are actually still pointing to the old fonts. So we need to drag and drop the new fonts in. And we need to do the same thing for character and response template. Now we go talk to the NPC. There we go. Now, one thing that I notice here is in order to continue with the dialog, I need to press enter not C. So I press C to start the interact and then I press enter to continue it. This is just the default setting for this add-on. If we go and look in the code, it's using UI accept. So far in these tutorials, we've been hard coding the inputs, but there is actually an input map, which it looks like this add-on is using. So we can just go ahead and add the C key to this. So if we look at UI accept, it's using enter right now. So all we have to do here is add 
C, which solves that problem. However, we do have a bigger problem here, which is when we start the dialogue, we can now walk around and continue the dialogue. And you can imagine if there were, say, monsters roaming around the screen, it could also be awkward if they attack us while we're talking to an NPC. Fortunately, there is a simple solution for this, which is to pause everything when NPCs are talking. The way that pause works in Godot is each of the nodes has a pause mode. By default, they inherit their pause mode from the parent, but we can set certain things to either pause or not pause, depending. So for example, if we go into Y sort and set Y sort to stop, Y sort and everything underneath it will stop processing when the game is paused. But now we run into a little bit of a problem because the NPC is one of the things that's being paused, but the dialogue balloon code is in the NPC's code. So when the NPC pauses, the dialogue balloon is going to freeze. So I think what we'll do for now is we're just going to move it back into the dialogue manager. We'll put it right here under the example dialogue balloon. And honestly, this isn't a great place to put it because hypothetically, we might want to update dialogue manager later which could overwrite this change. But I'm not going to worry about that for now. We won't need these references anymore. And then what we can do is we can say get tree dot paused equals true when you start showing the dialogue balloon. And if the dialogue is null, meaning there are no further lines of dialogue, then we will say else get tree dot paused equals false. And then back in NPC, we'll remove this and we will call dialogue manager dot show dialogue balloon. And I suppose just to be safe, we should also have the balloons pause mode be process. And there we go. You'll notice that the character's idle animations have stopped, but we are still able to interact with the dialogue. And of course, we can't move around while the dialogue is running. Now, I realize that I've uh, rushed through the explanation of Dialogue Manager a little bit. If you're curious about exactly how it works, I recommend that you go to the Asset Library and um, take a look at Nathan's videos, which are linked right here, but I'll also put them in the description. The last thing that we need to consider from an organizational standpoint is that right now we have this script npc.gd. And as you can see, we have hard coded in here that this is villager number one's dialogue. But what happens if we add a second villager who has different dialogue? For example, let's duplicate this NPC and have another one over here. Now we want the two NPCs to say different things, but villager one dialogue is currently hard coded in here, and we don't want to have to write a different script for each NPC in the entire game. Fortunately, there's an easy way to solve this, which is we can export the variables that control which dialogue resource we're using and which title from that dialogue resource we're accessing. So I'm going to put export var, we'll call it dialogue resource, and it is going to be of type resource. And then I'll also export var dialogue title, which is just a string. And then we can replace this with dialogue title. And then rather than preloading this resource, we can just plug in the resource. In this dialogue file, I'm going to create something for villager2 to say, call it villager2 dialogue. We'll name this villager John, and John will say, hello, nice weather today, isn't it? And now in the scene, we can go over here to Bob, and we can drag our dialogue resource in here and enter villager01 dialogue. Whereas for John, we still drag in the same dialogue file, but now it's villager2 dialogue. All right, and now we can go up and we can talk to John. And John says, nice weather today, isn't it? And we can go over and talk to Bob. And Bob says, it's dangerous to go alone, take this. And so by exporting the dialogue file and the title that we're referring to, we can use the same NPC code for all of our NPCs and just change these variables when we add the NPCs to the screen. So this will save us a lot of code files. Now we should be able to add lots and lots of NPCs, each with their own unique dialogue, which we can manage using this system here. Well, that's it for now for dialogue. I'll probably come back to this topic later because there's a lot we haven't considered. But next time I'd like to shift focus to the camera and specifically how to manage transitions between different areas using the camera. Thanks for watching.